All right, everybody, welcome back in. Kansas City Chiefs 2021. Week one has come and gone. Victory for the Kansas City Chiefs over the Cleveland Browns. In past seasons, I haven't really gone with you guys through the regular season. It's kind of just showing up during the off season for my favorite part, the roster building. This year, I may not be with you every week, but I will try to show up on most weeks and give out grades and impressions and things like that. Um, the biggest takeaway from Cleveland, Kansas City, before I get to any of the details, and there's a lot to talk about, is that Kansas City won, and this is two good teams, all right? Both of these teams are good football teams. Both of them should be in the playoffs. Both of them have some hopes for the Super Bowl, and Kansas City won. That's the biggest takeaway. It wasn't pretty. We'll talk about that here in a second. But those that above all, above anything else to say, that's the most important thing here for the Kansas City game for the Kansas City Chiefs. Right here on the board, I've got some grades for the people that I have watched. I haven't done the extra video work for the secondary or for some of the receivers or the tight ends or for the, some of the linebackers, but these are the people that I did go back and do extra video work on, so I have a pretty good handle on how their games went on Sunday. We'll talk about that very briefly, and then I have a couple of uh, diagrams here we'll go over as well. Offensive line for the Kansas City Chiefs, not a good day. But you kind of expect that, right? Week one with a brand new offensive line against a good football team in the Cleveland Browns, a team who can also run the football. You, you kind of knew going in that it probably wasn't going to be a big splash for the offensive line. The offensive line, probably above any other unit, needs a ton of communication, a ton of time together, a ton of experience. By the way, um, rain's supposed to be coming in, in here in the area, so if it's sitting on the roof and, and interrupting the audio, I apologize. I'm going to push right on through it because this is my time to do it, okay? But the offensive line, not a good day. Patrick Mahomes never really got comfortable back there in the pocket. In fact, it almost looked like Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy had kind of sort of expected that the offensive line wasn't going to be in great shape in terms of performance, and they, they kind of sort of already had a game plan in place just in case and Patrick Mahomes could move around and, and still find his targets and still and still find people to throw to. So they moved the ball okay in the first half, and then, of course, in the second half just exploded, especially there in the fourth quarter. Um, uh, so the offensive line didn't look great. We'll talk about Orlando Brown more in a second. But they, they didn't look horrible either. There were some good things. There were some things that I liked there with the offensive line. Overall, a D, D plus, C minus for the offensive line. For the defensive line, on the flip side, um, not a good day for the defensive line either, unfortunately. Chris Jones had two major sacks and some quarterback pressures, but other than that, the defensive line was, was kind of bland. Jaron Reed was in there a good bit. Derek Naughty was in there a good bit. Um, and, and really just not a lot of push on Baker Mayfield aside from Chris Jones. They got after Mayfield a couple of times, but Mayfield actually spent more time in the pocket on plays that, that he wanted to be back there on his spot than Patrick Mahomes did. And, and that's to be expected. The Cleveland Browns offensive line has been together longer. But, you know, you would expect that the, that the defensive line for Kansas City would have a little bit more push than they got. And, and really, they just weren't able to do that at all. Um, other than Chris Jones, for the most part, and, and a couple of other plays. Just kind of a bland effort. Cleveland was able to run the football a good bit. Moved the ball a ton on the ground, especially in the first half, of course. Cleveland kind of did whatever they wanted to. Um, so not a great day for the defensive line either. But I expect both lines to be good, to be better moving forward as the season goes along. It's a great coaching staff. They'll work these players into good communicating shape and everything else. And I do expect the lines to be better as the season goes along. But for week one, the grades, D plus, C minus for both. If you disagree, by all means, put it in the comments. I often, I'm not ignoring you guys. I just don't always have time to answer the comments. If you got a question, I apologize if I don't get to it. Or if you just totally disagree and you think the lines look better, I, I didn't think they looked good on either side of the football for Kansas City on Sunday. But week one against a good football team, nothing that alarms me as far as the groups themselves. Okay, Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill. I, I'm not discrediting the other players on the football team, but the reason that the Kansas City Chiefs won the game on Sunday is because of Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill. Hey, we haven't seen a team in football yet who can really totally shut down Tyreek Hill, especially not when Kelsey is floating around and doing the underneath stuff and you have to bracket him too. 
Tyreek Hill had almost 200 yards receiving. Patrick Mahomes, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, was over 300 yards passing for the day. Not bad in the first half. They were moving the football in the first half, but then in the second half just started tearing it up. Um, you know, these two guys right here, Patrick Mahomes, uh, Tyreek Hill, A++, I mean, they were just outstanding, okay? They, they complement each other so well. Mahomes is a power thrower. Tyreek Hill can run anywhere he wants to on the football field. Just keeps going deep and deep and deep, just slicing across the deeper parts of the football field. I'm not sure there's a defense out there that can really come up with a way to shut down both Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. You might find a way to shut down one of them, but the other one's just going to explode on you. So that's the reason Kansas City really won this game. They, they didn't have a good day, but Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill were just unstoppable. I mean, just an outstanding day for both these guys. Everybody else was contributing and putting it in, but if you don't have Mahomes or if you don't have Hill, you don't win this game. It's point blank, and Kansas City did. A for Mahomes, A for Hill. Outstanding effort there. Chris Jones, okay, it's real easy, and, and I haven't read any articles yet, so I don't know what people are saying. I haven't read the fan sites. It's real easy to look at Chris Jones' two sacks, especially the one in the fourth quarter that just blew up the whole stadium. I thought the stadium might actually lift off its foundation and shoot up into the sky at that point because the crowd was so into it. It's real easy to look at those two sacks and the momentum that came along with those two sacks and say, wow, what a great decision to push Chris Jones over to defensive end. It's not that simple. There's a lot more to it. We're going to get into it here in a second. But a good day for Chris Jones. He was okay against the run. He wasn't great. He had one play in particular where he totally blew up the running play. He didn't even get credit for it on the tackle. Blew it up. But there were lots of other running plays where he wasn't quite in place. He looked a little bit out of place. And to be honest, there at defensive end, um, and we'll talk more about Chris Jones in a second, he, he did not look like his normal self out there at defensive end. Now, he got a lot of quarterback pressures on, on Mayfield from the edge, but there's more to playing defensive end than just getting pressure on the quarterback, especially in today's modern NFL. So Chris Jones looked great at getting court pressure on the quarterback from the defensive end spot, as we expected him to. There were some other areas there, though, that you have to take into account when you're when you're grading the move of Chris Jones from defensive tackle, where he is amazing and he is an all-pro, out there to defensive end. We'll talk about that more in a second, but I give a, a B for Chris Jones and the move out there so far. Orlando Brown at left tackle. We'll talk more about him in a second on the diagrams, too. Not a good day for Orlando Brown. Basically, whenever Orlando Brown wasn't getting help blocking, Miles Garrett was in the backfield. Again, I know it's Miles Garrett. Nobody can really block Miles Garrett the whole day. It seemed like Orlando Brown really kind of struggled to block Miles Garrett at all at any point in time. I, I'm not trying to tear Orlando Brown down. I think he'll get better. But Orlando Brown is not a rookie. Orlando Brown is the guy who's already played right tackle for several seasons, played left tackle for the Ravens last year. It's just his first game for the Chiefs. It's not his first game of professional football. This is a guy that you made a big trade for. This is a guy that you're planning on handing a lot of money to. You would really like to see a more even fight between Miles Garrett and Orlando Brown than what we saw on Sunday. It was a total mismatch. In every way, every second of the entire game, it was a total mismatch. And while I do think that Orlando Brown will improve as the season goes along. And I do understand he was going up against Miles Garrett. When you roll over to left tackle, when you've been traded for several draft picks, and when you're planning to get a lot of money from that franchise, you should be able to do a whole lot better against the best edge rushers in football. And and we didn't see it Sunday. I'll talk more about that on the diagram here in a second when I, when I switch over here. But not a good day for Orlando Brown. It's not an effort thing. I'm not questioning his effort or work ethic or anything like that. But the performance was rough, really rough. Okay, so uh, a D there for Orlando Brown based on performance. Nick Bolton, the rookie. Um, this is this is where it gets interesting. If you go to if if you go to Pro Football Focus and they grade all the players every week and, and every season, and I respect the heck out of them. I subscribe to them, and I, I love reading their grades. 
they kind of downgraded Nick Bolton. They've got him, and I can't give out the grade on, online, but they've got him uh, as having a subpar game, basically. I really liked what I saw out of Nick Bolton on Sunday, and the reason for it is it, it's, it's not that he was exploding the whole game, but they I really thought they asked a lot of him. It, it didn't seem like they babysat him during the game. He seemed to be having a lot of responsibilities in coverage. He seemed to have a lot of responsibilities in the running game. He seemed to have a lot of responsibilities in getting after the quarterback. He played what I call a 3D, three-dimensional game. Coverage of receivers, um, running game, and the quarterback. And, and I thought, and there were a couple of plays where we saw from him what we saw on the highlight films back when he was in college. One play where he bounces off the tackle and just goes and destroys the running back. Another play where he beats the tackle on the edge and chases Baker Mayfield all the way across the field. He never actually got there before Mayfield let go of the ball. But Nick Bolton was in full pursuit. And, and, and there were other plays, you know, where Bolton just looked solid. I really like what we saw out of Nick Bolton. Now, I, I, I don't expect him to be an all-pro. I don't, I don't project him to be that. But I thought we saw a solid game out of Nick Bolton. And I thought Kansas City asked a lot out of him to be playing in this game against a very good football team with a lot of things going on. You've got a guy in Baker Mayfield who can throw the ball and who can run. You've got running backs who can run the ball and catch. You've got a decent offensive line. I thought they asked a lot of Nick Bolton, and I thought he responded solidly. And to me, he looks like a guy who can start for a long time in this league and hold down the starting job. That's what I saw of Nick Bolton on Sunday. It's one game. There were times where he looked a little confused, maybe wasn't quite sure where he should be, especially when he was dropping back in coverage. I think he'll learn. I think he'll pick it right up. I think he's a brilliant guy in terms of football IQ. So I give Nick Bolton a B on the day, and I'm really not surprised by that. I don't think most of you are either listening to, uh, to some of the talk here in the offseason. Okay, so that's for Nick Bolton. Creed Humphrey, I've got him listed as a C. Now, again, this is where if you go into Pro Football Focus, they've actually got a very good grade on, uh, on Creed Humphrey for the day. And I see a little bit different. When I looked at the game for, for Creed Humphrey, I didn't think they asked him to do as much playing that central position. I thought he didn't get as much pressure up the middle from the Browns as he will get from other teams like the Ravens. Moving throughout the season, I think he'll get a lot more pressure up the middle. He'll be faced with a lot more tough decisions about who to block. I didn't think the Browns put a lot of pressure on Creed Humphrey. And when they did, I thought Kansas City gave uh, Creed Humphrey a good bit of help from, from Joe Tooney at times. Not the entire game, but at times. So Creed Humphrey played solid, but Creed Humphrey didn't, to me, do much during the game that really stood out. I kind of expected more. But, again, there wasn't a lot of pressure put on Creed Humphrey during this game I didn't expect. I'm sure he had enough pressure on him with it being his first NFL game. He played a good game. There's nothing negative for me to say about Creed Humphrey during this game. But, again, I didn't think Kansas City put too much of a burden on him during week one. I didn't think Cleveland put too much pressure on him. I, I thought that was interesting. Had it been me, and, again, I, 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 didn't, I didn't study every play from the Cleveland defensive line standpoint, I would have tested Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith up the middle a whole heck of a lot more than what Cleveland appeared to be doing. They seemed to be very satisfied with running the football um, uh, on, on their side of the field, and, and when it came time to put, uh, to put the offensive line of Kansas City to the test, they, they really didn't seem overly interested in putting a lot of pressure up the middle. And, and that's something that I, I think I would have at least tried to do. I would have tested those two young guys right there up the middle. Cleveland did a little bit of that, but not a whole lot uh, uh, during the day. So, I, I, again, Creed Humphrey, good day. Give him a C grade. But I didn't think they asked too much of him during, during the day on Sunday. Okay. Tyron Matthew and Willie Gay, I think this is a completely different game if even one of those guys is on the field. The secondary with Tyron Matthew running all over the place and making plays, all it takes is one play earlier in the game from Tyron Matthew and maybe Cleveland doesn't score a touchdown 
and maybe Kansas City does, and the score is reversed at halftime. So I, I, I thought the absence of Tyron Matthew was a big deal, but I thought the absence of Willie Gay, and again, he only got, it was a limited amount of snaps last year, but I really think Willie Gay is the best linebacker the Chiefs have right now, especially against the run. And I thought it would have been a great week for Willie Gay to help out in run support uh, against the Cleveland Browns, who love to run the football. And I thought not having him there, I thought that was a big deal. I thought that really allowed Cleveland to run the football, and that opened up everything else that Cleveland wanted to do. Whatever they wanted to do with Baker Mayfield, all the receivers they wanted to get the football to, it all came off of that running game for Cleveland. And I really thought not having Willie Gay in the game on uh, on Sunday was a big deal. I, I really thought that was a big difference. And, and, and you know, listen, every week is like that for almost every team, right? Somebody's going to be injured and, and somebody's going to be at a disadvantage. Excuse me. Somebody's going to be at a disadvantage. Somebody's going to be missing somebody. But of all weeks, Cleveland, who really loves to run the football and is really good at it, having Willie Gay right there, I think, would have made a huge difference early on in that football game. And Cleveland really was controlling the first half. They were able to dictate the Kansas City, not Kansas City dictating the Cleveland. And I thought Willie Gay could have stopped a lot of that or helped to stop a lot of that had he been able to play. So we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to getting him back. All right, I'm going to take the camera. I'm going to twist it around now. I have a couple of diagrams to show you. If the rain holds up long enough, okay. Um, we want to talk about Chris Jones and Orlando Brown more in depth. And I, and I really think getting a look at it um, on, the, on the diagram makes a big deal. So Chris Jones, he, he moved around some. He, he moved around to the other defensive end position. He moved to defensive tackle a little bit, but he spent most of his time at the at the defensive end, at one defensive end position, and and he really spent a ton of time right out there. The sacks, when he was allowed to, when he was allowed to just tee off and go after the quarterback, he's unstoppable, and Cleveland had no way to stop him at all. Cle uh, Chris Jones, if he doesn't have to worry about the running game. And if he doesn't have to drop into the flat and cover anybody, Chris Jones cannot be stopped out there defensive end, okay? That much is clear. Whenever Chris Jones has the green light to just go to the backfield and get the quarterback, Chris Jones can get to the backfield and get after the quarterback. That can happen anytime Chris Jones or the Chiefs basically decide. But when you're playing defensive end, you have a lot of, a lot of other responsibilities. And part of that is... Somebody, the linebacker of the defensive end, has to shift out here to the flat and cover the screens or cover a running back or cover the quarterback as he slides out there. And, and that was where Chris Jones struggled, and he's always going to struggle, all right? You don't really understand how big Chris Jones is until you see him lining up out there at defensive end. He kind of gets swallowed up in the middle when he's at defensive tackle, right? He kind of blends in. When he's standing out there at defensive end, he is a massive, massive behemoth of a man. And it, he, he just looks humongous out there at defensive end. And even though he is a, he, he, can have, he will have no trouble ever getting to the quarterback, ever, he will also never be able to consistently come out here to the flat and cover any screens, any wide receiver, any running back, any quarterback at all. It's just not going to happen. He doesn't have that kind of speed. He does not have that kind of fluid athleticism. He's a big giant of a man. And when he gets moving in one direction with that speed, with that strength, with that size, he's unstoppable. But when you try to put him out in space, which, by the way, Kansas City didn't do that much. I, you know, it was two or three times. It wasn't much during the game. But you're not going to see it much. And that's something that you have to take into account when you're talking about the Chris Jones move, okay? Because there are a lot of defensive ends all over the NFL who, while they cannot do what Chris Jones does and get into the quarterback, they do a lot of other things that defensive ends need to do. And that helps keep quarterbacks kind of in a box. It helps cover wide receiver screens. And it helps cover running backs who are going out there in the flat. Chris Jones is just not going to be able to do that, okay? So 
Keep that in mind when you're grading the Chris Jones, Chris Jones move. Out here in the flat, he, he just he's not going to be able to do it. Uh, he'll try. The effort will be there. He, he, there will be times where he might make a good play. But it, listen, this is something to watch out for. A good, smart team like the Ravens or like the Patriots, if, if, which they're smart. We'll see if they can be good enough to get in the playoffs. Good, smart teams in the playoffs will be ready to expose the thought that Chris Jones might actually go out to the flat at some point. They will be ready to take advantage of that, okay? So you don't want to see that much. And, and when you move Chris Jones to defensive end, you are losing that athleticism at the defensive end spot that a lot of other defensive ends can do. And that's not going to change, okay? Also, in the running game, Chris Jones was solid, but he did not look as comfortable playing defensive end against the run as he did when he's a defensive tackle. And I mentioned this in the preseason. When you take a guy who's best at one position, and that's his strength, and you put him out there at another spot, there's a trade-off. And part of the trade-off is that while he can still get to the quarterback, and he won't get double teamed as much, he's not going to be as good against the run. He wasn't horrible. In fact, I mentioned it a second ago, he had one amazing play where he just totally shut down the running play, and I think Nick Bolton came in and made the tackle. So he's not in up out there defensive end against the run, but he's just not going to be as comfortable out there. I don't think that's going to change either. He'll improve as the season goes along in the running game at defensive end. He'll improve, but you're still losing something there. Right there at defensive tackle, that's his spot. That's his strength. I get it. Defensive end is weak and thin for Kansas City. They're doing what they've got to do. It's better than spending a lot of money on some other free agent there at defensive end. I'm all in on that. I, I, I'm all in favor of that. But this is the trade-off, okay? This is what you what you give up. And, and then the last thing is fatigue. <coughs> and this is something else that we mentioned in the preseason, talking about the Chris Jones move. Chris Jones is so big, and he is not accustomed to running around out there at defensive end. He had a lot of plays where he had to cover a lot of yardage that he would not have to cover if he were playing defensive tackle. He's farther from the quarterback right here, and anytime he does get pressure on Baker Mayfield, instead of getting Mayfield just off of his spot and right in Baker Mayfield's face, Baker Mayfield now has the option of just flushing out this way. And, and so Chris Jones, even though he gets pressure on Baker Mayfield, it's not in Mayfield's face. It's not as uncomfortable for the quarterback as, as as having a guy in your face. It's a lot easier to just be able to roll to one side. You, you know you still at least have, have, have one side of the field open. The wide receivers know to move to that side of the field. When Chris Jones is lined up at defensive tackle and they get pressure right in the quarterback's face, quarterbacks are a whole lot more uncomfortable. Even Tom Brady, for, for his entire career, has talked about yeah, and not really talked about, but everybody else has talked about how uncomfortable Tom Brady is with pressure right in his face. You have a lot fewer options as a quarterback when you have a guy right in your face. You can't even sometimes see downfield. When you're flushed out, um, a lot of times you can still see downfield as the quarterback. And this guy, Chris Jones, spends a lot of energy chasing a guy that he wouldn't do if he were at defensive tackle. I thought we saw that in the second quarter. Chris Jones was out for several plays in the second quarter. I don't know for sure why, but it looks like it was very hot there in Kansas City. I don't know how many of you were at the game, but it was very hot. And the second quarter was about the hottest part of the game. It looks like Chris Jones was kind of winded, and looks like that's why they took him out. It looks like he, it looked like he was hot and winded there somewhere in the middle of the second quarter. We didn't really see that as much again later in the game as we did there in the second quarter. The last thing I want to talk about with the Chris Jones thing, though, is Cleveland did a lot of this in the first quarter. They just simply, and I'm going to erase this for a second, Cleveland just simply ran away from, ran the play away from Chris Jones for a lot of the first quarter. And intermittently during the second and third quarter, they didn't get through as much in the fourth. And again, you know, that's going to happen some anyway. But the teams that play Kansas City are going to have this option every single time. 
that Chris Jones is at defensive end. And Cleveland did this a lot in the first quarter, did it some throughout the rest of the game. You can just run the play away from Chris Jones. And what happens is Chris Jones spends a lot of energy chasing down plays that he can't possibly reach. Whether it's the quarterback sliding the pocket out here, or whether it's the running back coming over this way, Chris Jones is spending a lot of energy basically accomplishing nothing. And when they want to, any team, the Cleveland Browns can do it, they don't have to block Chris Jones at all. They just, they know he cannot possibly get all the way across the field to cover this, so they don't have to use any blockers. And it can, when the teams want it to, it can create a numbers advantage over here, either running or just uh, pass blocking for, for Cleveland or for Baltimore or for all the other teams that uh, Kansas City plays this week. So, Chris Jones had two major sacks, two major sacks. The one in the fourth quarter, outstanding, beautiful, loved it. He consistently got pressure on Baker Mayfield throughout the game. He was unblockable at defensive end, but there, these were the trade-offs. The flat coverage, the, the running game not quite as comfortable, the fatigue factor in the second quarter, and then Cleveland does have some power there. All the offensive teams will this year. They have some power to kind of negate Chris Jones whenever they want to and create a numbers advantage right here. Hey, that, that's my hobby horse, I guess. I'm probably not going to get off of that hobby horse until Jerron Reed and Derek Noddy and Frank Clark and somebody else start to step up as the season goes on. And we'll see about that. We'll see how it goes. It's a long season. It's just week one. These are just things that we noticed here in week one. Okay, last thing, and this will be it, the Orlando Brown thing. And again, I'm not going to say nice things uh, about the left tackle spot here, week one for Cleveland, but it's only week one. Every week is different. And oh, by the way, not many people can, got, can block Miles Garrett, okay? Yeah, I'll put a great big asterisk right there by that, okay? I, I don't mean to discount that, okay? A lot of people are going to struggle against Miles Garrett, but you would rather see it be a much closer fight than what we saw Sunday. For Orlando Brown, and I'll try to talk here as we close down, <clears throat> they did a lot of rolled blocking for Orlando Brown. They rolled a lot of blocking over. What I mean by that is there were a lot of times where Joe Tooney came over and helped out Orlando Brown. There was a lot of that. Not as much in the first quarter, but second quarter on, there was a lot of this right here. Joe Tooney rolling over and helping out helping out uh, Orlando Brown with Miles Garrett. There was also a lot of this right here. Chip blocking. A lot of plays where Miles Garrett had the edge and a running back comes in here and puts on a hard chip block, which by the way, Credit to the Kansas City running backs. I didn't do my video work to know which running back did the best, but the Kansas City running backs did an excellent job in this game of getting good, hard, solid chip blocks on Miles Garrett. And there were a lot of plays where Miles Garrett could have gotten to Patrick Mahomes, and the only thing that stopped them was the running back blocking. So again, I. I didn't take the time to look at the running backs and see who was doing that blocking. I was just focused on the Orlando Brown part. But they did an excellent job of that. Now, here's the problem. Orlando Brown, you traded a lot of draft picks to get him. The Ravens have more good draft picks than you do now because you traded for Orlando Brown. And starting next season, you're looking at paying Orlando Brown a lot of money. Even if next year is a bit of a cap relief because of the first season, if you put him under the franchise tag or whenever the real beat of that next deal starts, you're going to be paying him a lot of money to be your franchise left tackle. And you just cannot make this big of a trade and give this much cap space to a franchise left tackle and devote this many resources to stopping one guy, okay? Now again, it's week one. They'll get better. It is Miles Garrett. I'm not underestimating that. But when you play left tackle in the NFL and you've been traded for several draft picks and you're making a lot of money, 
you are expected to be able to put up a much better fight against the best edge rushers in football. It'll be Miles Garrett one week. It'll be somebody else the next week. Every week, Orlando Brown is going to be going up against the best edge rushers in football. That's not going to change from week to week. Every week it's going to be somebody. And yeah, there are a few breaks in there with edge rushers who just aren't as good. But every week you'll be going up against the best edge rusher the other team has to offer. And you got to show better than that. So again, this isn't Orlando Brown's first week in football in the NFL. He's played left tackle before. He's played several seasons now of football in general. Not an impressive performance in any way. He had a handful of plays where he was able to shove Miles Garrett back toward the inside, kind of get all mixed up in the scrum. But by and large, for the most part, when Orlando Brown didn't get help from Tooney or from the running back, Miles Garrett was in the backfield. For the most part, that was happening. Now, again, same thing is happening on the other side with Chris Jones. You can say the same thing about the Browns left tackle going up against Chris Jones. I understand that, but when you're Kansas City, you've given up all these draft picks, and you're considering, you've kind of already planned on giving him a lot of cap space, you need to see a better performance than that, all right? And we'll see how that happens moving forward, but this, this was two points of interest for Kansas City this week, among other things. All right, we've, we've talked long enough. If you're still watching, thank you very much. Um, by the way, I'm doing an internship with something called Championship Sports Media, writing a few articles, doing a college football podcast. If you feel like rolling over to their website and checking that out, I've already done a couple of Kansas City Chiefs article. At some point, if I'm smart enough to figure out the technology, I'll try to get the link here uh, below the video for some of, these, for some of the Kansas City articles, and you can check that out as well. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Bye.